Hey everybody and welcome back to Dude's Brunch, your late night morning talk show. I'm your host, Taylor Olmsted, and I'm here to talk to you about four things we found on the internet this week, as well as what we ate for breakfast, because that's how this podcast works. With me, fresh off the heels of Gen Con, the gaming convention in Indianapolis, Indiana, it's Tyler Reed. Tyler, what did you have for brunch today at Gen Con? Hey everybody. Well... Uh, the hotel I stay at has a continental breakfast, and the the special of the day was biscuits and gravy. And boy, oh boy, did I have a singular biscuit and some sausage gravy and some eggs and some potatoes. And I decided to myself, hey, I'm not going to probably eat for the next six hours, <laughs> six to eight. <laughs> Who knows? I, don't, I didn't know what I was going to eat again, <laughs> as per usual at Gen Con. So I was like, let's just make a... French toast and sausage sandwich. So I had that as well because I am the Lord of, of Gluttony, so apparently. so <laughs> Lord of Gluttony, that's a new title. Are you going to add that to your Twitter bio? <laughs> nice. <laughs> and Tyler, did you meet up with friend of the show David Lore at Gen Con? No, I didn't. There, listen, there was a lot of things I wanted to do, and there was a lot of things... That I didn't do, and the, those two lists are basically the same thing. <laughs> so, I guess apologies from all of us for Tyler's inability to network at Gen Con. Well, you know. Sean, how are you, buddy? What did you have for brunch today? I had coffee and raspberries. Were these organic Whole Foods raspberries? No, these are just regular store raspberries. I wasn't sure because, you know, Whole Foods is ruining your life and whatnot. Yeah. Question though, why is why is cold brew coffee so expensive? Because it's the illusion of value. It's it's just a different process, and because they like have a like limited scarcity, like they like force like a scarcity on it because they're like, oh, we brew it for twenty hours, so they have to like prepare it in advance. It's like, well, we sold out of it. You know, Wait, so so it just so the thing is that it just takes you longer to brew it. Yeah. All right. Question solved. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> Hater shades right now. There you go. All right. I mean, it's it's not a very good reason because it's literally the same product, just prepared a different way. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it. It's it's actually a more almost primitive process because there is less involved in it. Tyler, the thing is, you could say that about like a steak from a steakhouse versus a steak from Golden Corral. <laughs> like different process, different sure. outcome. Does Golden Corral sell steak? <laughs> they sure do. <laughs> And it sure know, is meat. Not individually, but you can get 20 of them if you really want. <laughs> well, our guest this week, I hope he didn't eat a Golden Corral steak this morning. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's comedian, musician, writer, podcaster, blogger, critic. I don't even know what all you do anymore. Ryan gave us. Ryan, how are you, man? How am I? Yeah. Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, it's build up. I really I wear many hats. Uh, it's uh, it's almost cumbersome. Well, what did you have for brunch today? <laughs> so I didn't necessarily have brunch, but I think the first thing that I ingested today was uh, a jalapeno popper. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Well, my one of my roommates had like a bunch of people over for a, a cookout, and uh, the first things that were available were like a tray of jalapeno. Pop- so uh, and then more things but that was probably the closest to brunch <laughs> i mean brunch is really a state of mind is it not <laughs> it is i'm planning on after this podcast i'm probably gonna have some brunch <laughs> well hopefully it won't take that long to record oh no i hey i'm not like as you know time is relative it sure just like, is just like brunch well, as always, we're going to talk about four different topics this week, and you can play along at home at dudesbrunch.wordpress.com backslash bingo. The first person to tweet in a picture of a winning bingo board using tropes from the show gets a free handmade prize from one of us, probably Sean, because he's the only one who has his life together enough to actually make prizes. All right, so I've got our first topic this week, and as we record this, I am at home in Atlanta As this is released, I will be in Cincinnati, Ohio, returning from Athens, Ohio, only to drive back down to Atlanta. And I just got in last night 
or eight days ago as you listen to this, from New Mexico. So basically what I'm saying is I've been traveling a lot and I didn't have time to write up an actual topic for this podcast. <laughs> so what I want to talk about is travel in general. I guess I just feel like travel is kind of interesting because everybody tends to do it a little bit differently. Going around the airport this time, I was particularly interested in watching other travelers and the weird things that other travelers do. And so to start with, how does everybody prepare when they have a long bout of travel coming up? Like, what are the things that you do? What do you pack? How do you like mentally prepare for the odyssey of TSA and layovers and all of the mess that is travel tons of preparation just having like everything set out about and let me let me say this in my preparation i mean i plan for the worst and hope for the best like if i know it's going to take us two hours to get through security i'm there like two hours and 45 minutes early Mm. assuming that there's going to be a line just assuming that like there's only going to be one person who's working the whole thing i I don't know or i'm not going to find parking because if something happens, I don't want to run late. So I'd rather be there. But I, that said, I like all the stress before that makes actual traveling less stressful because I know that it's going to be okay. You know, I, I can walk into a terminal and if I'm 45 minutes early and go to a restaurant and get something to eat without having to like run around and like looking, you know, like, oh my God, I don't know what's going on. I, I just hate that feeling. So. No, that's just airports. Yeah, I'm pretty similar in general with travel. I, like, stress out before I go, but then as soon as I step into the terminal or get on the train or whatever, like, all of the stress is gone and I'm just there. But yeah, it's the getting through TSA, or the big one for me is making sure that my phone is charged, because I usually do, like, more mobile boarding pass. And I love the mobile boarding pass because I don't lose my phone. I tend to lose the paper ones. But then your phone always has to be charged, or you can't get on the plane or the train or whatever, which kind of sucks sometimes i definitely feel the same way because um i had a year ago like uh a flight had been delayed and they were like oh we can switch you to a different flight that's leaving in 30 minutes or whatever but it was at LaGuardia in new york and i barely like by the skin of my teeth I, i made it uh and it was terrifying to me. And I, I even, I mean, like you said, uh, Sean, I took the same precautions to be there a good, like I always, with airports, to try and show up like two hours before uh, mm-hmm. boarding. I'm just super terrified of missing a flight or something like that. So, uh, yeah, so I mean, I that's always number one is making sure, like, will I be there at least two hours before the plane leaves? Um and then, yeah, I mean, like, as far as packing goes, it's definitely just making sure that I have everything necessary for my phone, my laptop. Uh, even, like, do I have myself, if it's if it's a flight or a train ride, if, if it's, like, a like a, like a lengthy trip, I, I want to make sure that I'm going to be entertained for it, like I bring a book or something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's probably how I, it's how I go about it. <laughs> So, Tyler, how do you prepare for big rounds of travel, both physically and mentally? I don't. <laughs> Is that a good answer? That's, that's his preparation. He just doesn't do it. Um, that's an interesting question to ask. Um, of course, I always say when questions are interesting when I don't know what to say about them. Um <laughs> Can you repeat the question? How do you prepare yourself for, like, a gauntlet of travel? I don't know if I've really traveled that consistently that much. I mean, really, it's just, like, the day before I pack my shit up. I make sure I have some comfy clothes. So, Tyler, are you one of these people that just, like, you throw a bunch of shit in a bag and you get to the airport whenever you get to the airport or whatever? I try to be on time for, for, for most things, but I feel like, you know, like... For these kind of situations, like, stuff where it actually matters that I'm on time, like, you know, we got to be there by this time. Like, for example, I they, we had a dinner at 7.30, you know, uh, on Wednesday, so I made sure that, like, I was there in advance. I, I was, I was like, all right, so we got to get there at, like, 5.30 so we can get into our hotel, we can do this, blah, 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 blah. If So I definitely think I have an organization, like, like within in regards to, like, specific events, but, like, within of itself, like, preparing for it, 
I was preparing like literally the hour before because I knew it wasn't going to be a big deal because I just have X clothes thrown in a bag. That's it. Tyler, I feel like you're the worst kind of person to travel with because the rest know. of us <laughs> sound like it. The rest of us were all like, "Oh yeah, you know, make sure we have phone chargers or a book, and like make sure that you're at the airport early. You can get through TSA and everything." And you're just kind of like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna get there, and it's gonna be what the fuck ever." Like, to be fair, I've never flown either, so I, I wouldn't know. You've That's never all. flown in your life. I've never, I've never flown. All well, right, you're not really missing that much. To be fair, it has nothing to do with me as a person, I've just, like, for a long time, well, actually, for the most part, like, my father is like, oh, I don't fly in planes because they're dangerous. I'm like, well, all right, well, I guess we're not flying in planes. <laughs> also, I mean, to be fair, you have no idea how maps work. That's true, I know. So I booking no flights would be hard, hard for you. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and let you insult him because he hasn't flown on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Taylor does find a reason to insult just about everyone for any possible situation that could ever occur. So, Y'all threw a bunch of shade at me last week, so I just felt like I? it was my turn. So when I was listening to Ryan talk about how he plans activities, this is one thing I actually have to consciously think about when I travel anywhere, because I feel like I bring so many activities, like I think I'm going to have so much downtime, and then I do absolutely nothing. <laughs> I don't read... Like, I bring a book, I'll never read it. I bring, like, a pen and pad to, like, write a journal or something, never touch it. Like, it just never happens. It never does. If anything, yeah, I, mean, I did bring, bring you know, like, like, I just need to get an iPad so I can watch Netflix. I mean, I brought an iPad, but I didn't need it. I never used it once, so. I also brought headphones, which I never needed. Although I do, I do bring them. I guess if it, this is part of the first question that you asked me, I guess I do bring headphones because I do need those times when I just need to, like, zen out. Because at a certain point, I'm tired of just hearing the constant chatter of people, and like, kind of want to like have some like silence, even though it's technically more more sound, like being directly input into my ears. But it it kind of cancels out a lot of the white noise, I guess. No, I'm right there with you on that one. Um, I always bring headphones when I travel, and it's largely for that reason. Like, I want to get away from all the ambient noise or signal to people around me that I don't want to make small talk. And so I usually put in uh, like a big backlog of podcasts so that I can just have conversation in my ears, but not, like, I don't have to, like, mentally commit to it, if that makes sense. Music just seems like the easy way to go, because turn it on and off with the with a button. You know, put your headphones in, you can pretty much just go to town. But I feel like when I read, I have all these different parameters that have to be met. Like, I have to be in a quiet place, and it has to be lit and, like, well. And, you know, I, I can't be sitting someplace in my legs, or else I'm going to fall asleep. And it's just, like... I have, to get in the, I have to get in the zone to do something else. And music is just, like, on, off. So Tyler brought an interesting point about traveling with your iPad. Do you guys travel with full-size computers anymore, or are you just traveling with the iPad? I do not own an iPad. So I don't I, own an iPad either. Yeah, I do travel with my laptop. Me too. So I asked this question because my trip to New Mexico was the first trip I've taken ever where I like extended trip where I didn't bring my laptop. And I have to say, it's kind of nice. Like For sure. You can only do so much work from an iPad and the rest of the stuff you can do on it is just like watch Netflix or read iBooks or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so it was kind of nice to be able to tell the outside world all I can do is respond to your email and maybe not even that. Sucks to suck. <laughs> like that was pretty nice. Mm-hmm. Okay, next question. <laughs> Thanks, bud. Love you too. Oh man. <laughs> so this question really only applies to uh, Ryan and Sean, I guess. But do you do a checked bag when you fly, or are you a carry-on only type of person? If I can manage the carry-on, yes. Lines have different standards, and they're constantly changing them too about what constitutes as you know safe for the overhead compartment. I think I specifically received a bag of luggage for Christmas this past year that was, like, tried and true, will be, you know, uh, carry-on approved. But occasionally, depending on which airline I fly, they'll still screw me and make me uh, check it, which is unfortunate. But but occasionally you get away with it where, like, you can lie your way into it and be like, oh, they told me it would be fine, and then they just check it for free while you're about to board. So that's always nice. Sean, you seem like a carry-on type of guy. Um, no. 
actually, no. Really? Yeah. Um, it goes with the whole non-ha- non-hassle of having to travel, um, which is interesting because there's no part about flying where there's ever any certainty. See, that lack of certainty really concerns me because I'm always afraid that my checked bag is going to get like stuck at one of my layovers. And that is my greatest fear in traveling, is that I'm going to end up in a place and all my shit's going to be in another place. So are you, like, travel with an itinerary type of people, or are you kind of take things as they come, go wherever you feel like as you travel? Depends on where I'm going. I've really only taken one serious trip out outside of the U.S., and for, a, for something like that, where I, I took 11 days across various parts of Europe, then I definitely had an itinerary. Um, but for the most part, if I'm going someplace for a week or whatever, I just make sure I have enough clothes and a book and headphones. And that's, that's really about it. I'm, I'm a very practical uh, traveler, I guess. I don't, I'm not in need of many things. I mean, I'm pretty insistent upon <laughs> like quickly Googling everything kind of when we get there and trying to like, just figure out like what is going to be like the best, like local things to do in the area, like in terms of like food. Or uh, activities. I mean, I don't know. I'm because I just went to Indianapolis, and so there was there wasn't really a whole lot of like local delicacies, at least in the like the most immediate like downtown like business district area. So it was very like hard to really find anything that was really worthwhile. I mean, they were fine, but they I wasn't like, wow, I need to. This is the place I need to go every time. And it's, it's like it makes sense because most of the places are just closed on Saturday and Sunday, and it's like. You know, they're only there for, like, the business people mostly or, like, for conventions, which is a plenty in Indianapolis considering they have a pretty good convention center, so. I feel like I'm somewhere between Ryan and Tyler. Um, I usually have a set list of places that I need to be at certain times because if I'm traveling, it's usually, like, for a meeting or to visit people or whatever. But outside of that, I am, like setting up shop in a coffee shop, charging all my devices and frantically Googling like, you know, what's the best lunch in the area or what's the most highly Mm -hmm. rated, uh, microbrewery in town or whatever. Uh, I also like to ask around for stuff because I find that local people tend to have really good answers. So I showed up in Taos, New Mexico yesterday. The girl at the coffee shop told me that there was a farmer's market down the street. And then some people at the farmer's market told me to check out a museum and, so on and so forth throughout, like, three or four hours in Taos before my flight out of Albuquerque. So I like, like, a little bit of that make-it-up-as-you-go travel, but I have to have a set reason to be, like, taking the trip in the first place. Yeah, I've never traveled on business, like you were saying, or, like, a meeting or, or something like that, but uh, if I do... That's the thing, really. I don't know if I have the best answer for this, because I don't travel uh, to new places that frequently, but... Uh, I mean, I, I suppose, I mean, like I've been to a few like France and Italy, uh, once a few years ago. And I think my biggest regret is that I went with like education first, which was this, Hmm. they, they're like a national, (laughs) they, you know, they take, you're probably familiar, uh, where they take a bunch of language club kids and they kind of chauffeur them around Mm -hmm. and give them not the greatest experience of of a culture. That's what I regret. Like if I ever did you know, and I'm sure I will at some point because I, I loved it. Uh, but I do regret being taken on bus tours and stuff like that. Uh, I much preferred the moments where they let us, you know, walk around Florence for three hours. I mean, that's when I got the best sense of what the place is like. And so, yeah, I, it's uh, as far as itinerary goes, I, I definitely I mean, it's 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 fine. to. I'd never buy a book like there are all those. Uh, I don't know if they're like eyewitness books or whatever but it's like the oh if you're going to italy here's what you should do and it's like a little tiny traveler's book i wouldn't buy that but i would uh you know i'd I'd look ahead to see the must like the must see uh things you got like oh you got to try the gelato and you know you have to see the the duomo or whatever like you know but i'd also i think there's a lot um to be gathered from just experiencing it on your own and sort of just exploring you know I'm a mission traveler. I go to places and knowing what I'm going to do. I don't just go with whatever people are saying and stuff. <laughs> so, okay. You inherently I just trust travel. people, though. No, I don't have an inherent trust of people. I just, you know, I haven't always lived in a big city, but now that I live in D.C., 
there's so much to do here. I just, because I want to explore here and I can go home to my own bed at night. That's a huge thing. Not that I like, don't like hotels or something. Cause we already talked about that on the show. Hashtag great segments. Um, but I just, I like to, there's lots of stuff for me to do here. So like, but even when I do stuff around here, like if I go out, I go like to the art museum. That's my whole day. I don't like, or I go to the botanical garden. I don't try and fit in as much stuff as I can. It's just go and do that one thing and maybe go get dinner and then go home. I feel like I, a lot of times when I was growing up, we went out with my family. They tried to squeeze in like 16 things in one day and it just never got done. And it always made me mad. So my reaction to that is now I just plan on doing one thing and doing it really well or two things and doing them really well and then going home. (laughs) Like that's what I want. I don't want to just do the tour. I want to actually see something. So see, that's interesting. So you would like spend five days going through the Louvre in Paris no, no, probably not. But at least one day. Yeah. And I would devote the whole day to it. There wouldn't be, like, we're just got two hours. I mean, it would, like, a whole day, and I would probably just go see, like, one one or two exhibits, if that, if I could handle that. Like, there's no way I would try and see the whole museum. Like, I went to the Native American Smithsonian about two months ago, and it took me, like, six hours to get through. I did the whole museum, like, everything. And it took me, like, six hours. All right, so final thoughts on this topic. I want to know what everybody's best travel rule or tip is. And so I will go first. I think it is always important to bring some sort of external battery for your phone at all costs, whether it's one of those little brick things or a charging case or whatever. I think you need something with you other than just the wall plug adapter because airports do not have enough plugs. Um, travel tip, always have a toothbrush and underwear with you, um, and cash. <laughs> cash, toothbrush, underwear, you'll probably be okay. Great point. I forgot cash on this trip. That was a problem. You know what place doesn't take cash? That's right. You know what you can get when you uh, are stuck in a humongous layover, your flight gets canceled? What can't you get with cash? So <laughs> get yourself a new pair of underwear, maybe a new toothbrush. I don't know. That, that's that's my tip. You gotta have uh, maybe uh, okay. So add socks, add socks. Nothing nothing brightens a day like fresh underwear and socks. I guess I would say, and this only this only pertains to international travel, unfortunately. But I would say have some sort of a translation uh, guide on hand, uh, whether it be a book or uh, an app on your phone that works outside of the states. That could be very important, crucial in some some moments. What are my travel tips to travel to Gen Con? What's my fucking tips for Gen Con? I don't know, because that's going to be the only place that I'm going to give... Don't use official parking. Uh, I'm trying to think of, like... Okay, so I think the, one of the most important things is, like, most frequently hotels and stuff, they don't have free Wi-Fi. Like, we had Wi-Fi, but, God, was it garbage. It was not good. Like, it would just drop constantly, probably because there's thousands of people trying to access it all at the same time. So, like, if you're trying to do anything on your phone... Make sure you have is anything and everything downloaded in advance. Move, especially music or podcasts, because you're not downloading them once you get there. Speaking of travel, our next topic this week comes from Tyler, who just spent the week at Gen Con, the tabletop gaming convention in Indianapolis, Indiana. Tyler, what can you tell us about your convention experience, and what do you want to talk to us about? Okay, so, um, just got back, obviously, literally got a burger, my favorite animal, on the way home, (laughs) ate it, and and turned on the camera, so. (laughs) Title. That's the title. (laughs) Uh, so I literally am am as close to getting off of Gen Con as possible, so, um, and, I went there primarily to be a demo person for uh, Toy Creations, which is a local uh, game company uh, in Kentucky. Um, But I also went to try to promote my current job, my current gig, which is The Rook, which is a board game parlor cafe. And so I had designed some flyers to make, or I designed some flyers to get printed. And so my boss ended up, like, printing out, like, five like hundreds of them. (laughs) And so like, I was like, Oh, this will be so great. I'll talk to so many people and I'll hand stuff out. And like, I'll like network with all these different companies and it'll be, it'll be amazing. 
Well, the unfortunate part was when I got there was that there's a big hall. There's an exhibit hall that has all the people selling the stuff. And so that's only open from basically 10 o'clock to about 6 o'clock. And so after then, it's pretty much a free-for-all and everything else is closed. So a lot of the times I was, like, working the booth trying to, like, demo stuff. And so I didn't really have a lot of time really to go around, really go around and feel comfortable talking to people. And so one of the things I, f- I found myself really having a problem with is, like, asking for things, sort of like demo copies of games to use for at, uh, use for our library. So um, typically reviewers get free copies, like uh, the, the publishers just, just hand people games, you know. They're like, here, here's, like, five games, you know, to review so they can get them early, get them on time so people can generate buzz for it. Um, so it, it's not that they don't have games specifically designed for this intent, so... I'm just like, why don't I just go up and talk to them? Or why don't I just hand these like flyers out to people? I mean, I did. I talked to some people, not as much as I would have liked. But it's just like, it's. A, I, I discovered that my problem was not being able to ask for things and like dealing with people saying no. And that there's really, that's the worst, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. What are they going to do? They're not going to like get a gun and shoot me. Like, it's like, it's just a thing. Like what I was fortunate enough to have to talk to the right people, and there was like this indie game alliance that was able to give me like just like a handful of games from other like smaller smaller teams, like one person teams. So I was able to get some donations, but that was really my only real hookup. So I'm really trying to figure out a way to kind of be more okay with asking for help and asking, mm-hmm. you know, just and just asking for things from people and not being afraid of doing that. Maybe one of the approaches you should take is not so much to go to them and just ask for something as right. much as come up with a product to make it seem like they're contributing to something. So mm-hmm. like maybe when you go to OTR uh, next time, have a plan in mind, kind of show them that like you're going to start a local indie board game section or night or something. Show them that you're like that you're already doing this, you're established, and that you're ready right. to market these games to these people. And I think they'll be much more ready to bite mm-hmm. um, on something like that versus just asking for a donation because you work at the Rook. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that'll build you some cred real quick because. You realize that, like, I mean, I haven't really been to one of these things, but you're probably just another mid-20s guy who likes games walking around asking for stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, Although I'm not wearing a utility kilt, <laughs> I, I, I do look like a lot of other people there. <laughs> I, so, I, I think that's where, like, where, where you might find some more luck is... Sure. And that's definitely, like, sort of what the plan was, but it kind of was like I had to at least have something to show, because currently we have basically... No indie games, so we would like, like, what would I do? I would like take a photo of like our blank shelf that just says indie section. It's like it's your game here, which right. now that I say it out loud, probably would have made sense. But you know, I pretty much decided I wanted to do this like a week in advance, so it, I didn't really have a whole lot of time for it. But I'm more of like, I really just have more of a problem have like, uh, it's more about approaching people. I think maybe not a hundred percent like asking for things, but it's generally it's about like. Just even like starting a conversation with people I'm not familiar with that I have no idea if they're even gonna want to converse with me. Right. So. Well, that's a that's a risk that you take. I mean, you work at a you work at a thriving uh, game bar now, so it was difficult for me when I first started my job too. I didn't like really making small talk that much, but now I'm pretty comfortable walking up to anybody and talking to them about uh, what kind of pants they might want to wear. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, within the context of, of the cafe, because, I mean, that's technically, they've invited themselves to be approached by someone that works there. I'm just mm-hmm. a guy at a convention with millions of other people, and surely other people are, like, also looking for the same thing. Right. Free stuff. Right. So, I mean, it's just another it's just another case of probably imposter syndrome, if anything. Well, I think you bring up this interesting point, right, of, like, you're there with a bunch of other people who want the same thing. And so how do you prove that you're just not another person wanting free stuff or whatever? But I think you have to have kind of like, like Sean said, like your own unique spin or your own unique product or something that you can bring to the table. Mm. So I spent this past week um, out at Philmont shooting a bunch of photos and video, and it's always kind of uncomfortable approaching strangers, particularly out in the back country, <laughs> and like mm-hmm. shoving a camera in their face. <laughs> because they're like, Wait, I'm supposed to be, like, out here having this primitive experience with nature, and here you are. You've got, like, four cameras and an iPhone pointed at me, and you want to put a mic down my shirt and, like, all this stuff. One of the things that I was 
kind of learning from some of the more seasoned videographers out there is you just have to lean into that awkward Mm -hmm. because people, if you like owned the awkwardness of the situation and just take control, Mm -hmm. the other Mm -hmm. person will feel so awkward that they will just do whatever you ask them, which is great (laughs) as a video person or a photographer, because I can just be like, Hey, I need you to stand right here and say this specific thing into this camera. And they're like, um, sure. And I'm like, perfect. Here we go. We're going live in three seconds. Like, right. No, I feel that way about some customers too. Like not so much, not so much female customers, but like some male customers, like they kind of want to be told a little bit like what to wear. They don't really have any, any idea. You're using your knowledge base, using your experience and leveraging, leveraging that towards them, I think goes a long way in opening up conversations and doors you know, because maybe sometimes I found this in working my sales techniques. It's maybe it's not so much selling them something as much as it is getting them used to the idea. You know, maybe like seeing where else they've been or what other experiences they have, because you can mm-hmm. kind of break the wall um, to see like what's going on. Or maybe you get a really good nugget of information that's you know like this indie game or this game company is really into doing this kind of stuff. So go check them out and kind of gets you a better lead in terms of finding games that you could bring back. And I definitely think I experienced people were definitely nice to me and I didn't interact with as many people as I wanted to, but I did interact with people and I did have positive experiences. So I think that maybe I'm just being overly critical of what I was expecting for like my first time kind of being like a, uh, like a street team, being mm-hmm. like a personality, being right. like a person with like of fresh business in an area that technically we're not even in. So mm-hmm. it's like, there's a lot of like unknowns that were kind of going against me. And I, right. I, I, I feel like I also have a hard time giving myself any sort of credit for anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause I'm like, no, I didn't talk to a million people, you know, but I mean, so, just, just give it some time. Right. Cause like you, you're not Josh Whedon yet, but you know, I bet you when he goes and asks for a board game, they're pretty much just throwing whatever they have at him. Right. And I also have to understand that, that like respect is is earned, not mm-hmm. and, and not really given. Mm-hmm. So and I think the board game community really rely it really is is very strongly against like listen, you gotta put in the work. You gotta be like on the on Twitter, interacting with these people, like okay. hanging out, giving feedback, really being part of a community and not just trying to like leech onto it. Like they're really like genuine people that are like really invested in the hobby and like have like really strong opinions about like certain issues. And so it's just like you don't just get a free pass into the club just because you like work at a, at a, at a fucking business. You know, you don't, you don't get that. You have to like right. show them that you're worth even talking to. Right, and that's right. like, yeah, that's probably right. uh, I mean, it's, a, it's it's clicky, but, you know, that's but it's a professional yeah. business. These are right, people right. that are all working together to help right. each other better themselves and better those around them. So it's kind right. of like <laughs> well, because you have to you have to think, think about it from their standpoint as like a as a two-way transaction you know like right. they're they're giving you their game and, and you don't really want to pay for it but they're they expect some kind of compensation and when like like taylor and i were saying earlier when you have a brand when you're established as somebody who's like reputable you have this business plan that clearly seems to be working that that excites interest in them because they know that they can give you this and they're going to sell it you know they're going to mm-hmm. see a pickup from the Cincinnati area. They're going to see a pickup from, you know, like, are you talking to places, other, you know, game places, getting it out there like, hey, you guys should check this out. You know, they want to they probably want to see some results. And, right. And I, and I don't think it has to be something crazy. Like, they probably don't have to see like a sell out and like of everything. But it would probably be if they I don't know how you buy board games, but maybe if they buy something like, where did you hear about us? Like, Rook, OTR, it probably gets they probably give you the hookup, you know? Right. Ryan, I was wondering if you could speak to Tyler's comment about the community being so tight and kind of requiring you to prove your legitimacy. Because we were talking before we came on air about that in the comedy circles, which is, I know is something that you face. Yeah, uh, no, that was really interesting. I mean, I, I know I didn't comment much, but I've actually never been to a convention of any type before. That's fine. But no, I mean, it was interesting to hear about, and it is kind of... Uh, at least for me, I mean, I know it's traditionally not to not supposed to sound like a very. I mean, there uh, comic cons and, and this. What what is the name of this convention again for board games? 
Gen Con. Gen Con. It's, I mean, they're all functions that are aimed to uh, break down exclusivity or anything. It's all kind of like, a, oh, are you interested in this thing? Let's all band together and celebrate this for a few days. Um, but uh, it's almost kind of intimidating uh, to me. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly familiar with Comic Con and then even... In the more in the more niche realms, there's uh, furry con and stuff like that and whatnot. Which I'm not putting those on the same level, of course. But you know, they're, <laughs> but uh, but uh, they you know they both involve, of course, showing your fandom uh, by dressing up in in some some aspects. Uh, and do I do you want to do you want to give out your Twitter hashtag for anybody who wants to comment to you about this? Uh, sure, I guess. So. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't. Yeah, I, I wasn't. I don't know what I <laughs> what I need Who's to know. But... What do you guys think about this? Uh, Comic yeah. Con is Fairy Con. Uh, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not putting them. These French. <laughs> But uh, no, they do. They do share similarities. I mean, uh, you show your sort of uh, patriotism of, of the of the topics by you know wearing it literally on your sleeve, uh, and it's there's a it's almost it, like I said I'm I'm almost intimidated to a certain extent because I'm not sure if I am enough of a fan to take part in in something like this. For instance, if I this board game convention sounds very cool, but uh Tyler was talking about the indie games and stuff like that and I've played only a handful. I don't know, are you guys familiar with Zombies? That's the company oh. I went with. Oh, no kidding. Uh what's the name of them again? Twilight Creations. Twilight Creations. Yes. Okay, that's why it sounded familiar. Yeah, I play, I, I play, I play zombies uh, when I can. I, I, I have the original, and then I, I have like the Carnival and, and Jailbreak expansions. Um, but that's really the extent of it. I, I don't. I'm not very well versed in uh, board games, especially indie board games, and so I, I almost feel like I wouldn't be worthy of attending something like that. It would be neat to go and not even window shop, but like pick up cool new things. I mean, I, I have such a cursory knowledge of the whole thing i know uh is it killer killer rabbits killer bunnies 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 yeah. killer bunnies I, I remember that and uh um uh, you know various other ones but uh, i you know it is a little bit intimidating for someone who's removed from that because it's not my uh raison d'etre i i suppose i don't know tyler i mean are, are, this is my first time meeting you but are you steeped in this lifestyle this i mean is, is our board yes. games okay so there you go <laughs> what happened was i mean I, I I probably told a story, but it, it's not actually even a story. But I mean, I've been playing probably playing games my whole life, but mm-hmm. I probably seriously started getting into it about 2009, and then really sort of really get into it about 2011. Mm-hmm. Actually, was it 2000? No, it was thereabouts. Yeah, sure. I, uh, it doesn't matter. But anyway, because I you know I picked up a few games. I started with like Warhammer and like miniatures based games, and then mm-hmm. in college I started a board game club because I wanted to play more of these European these European style games and just generally games that I've I've picked up. Like I'd picked up a few of them from there, and then I met those people that I go to Gen Con with that I demo for. I met their son went to NKU, so it's like it was all sort of like kind of like together, and it's like it's not really. <laughs> so it's like I understand. It's like I. I it sounds like I'm like really experienced, but it's like I haven't been playing them for that long. It's only been five years, maybe. Sure. If it that, yeah, sure. It, it's only been five years, but you do have the connection there. You do right. sort of seem to have. I mean, you're demoing for for you know these guys, and you also have sort of uh, what seems like a a posse, I guess. I trying to. <laughs> yeah, sure, and and that's awesome, and that sounds great. Proving yourself, it shouldn't even have to be proving yourself because that's that sort of sounds shitty like you have like a worth that you have to it's like it, it for 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 gen con it seems like i mean board games are just like everyone can get in on that fun it's like if you like board games then you know it, it should just be believed <laughs> that you like board games and well the good news is that there's literally hundreds of of, of vendors there so mm-hmm. there's there's never any particular person that feels threatening because they really want you they want you to come in they have booths where you can get demos they sit mm-hmm. you down you know they, they tell you a little bit about the game you know they play like a round or two it's very welcoming you know they really take time to explain everything to you mm-hmm. and it's like but where the issue comes from is, is is i think it really has more to do with like sort of like my personality traits where i don't really want to like force <laughs> anyone to be in an uncomfortable position or be awkward <laughs> and and it's like the situation is typically I come up to someone and I'm like, hey, I work at this board game parlor. I was looking to see if I could talk to someone about getting some games donated. That person 
could just be just a dude that they just hired like the week before and yeah. they don't even technically work with the company right. and they're like, oh, sorry, no one that is important enough is actually here to talk to you about that. So mm-hmm. sorry. And for some reason that like the thought of going through that process is like <laughs> really well, okay. like makes me anxious. <laughs> oh, sure. so, so this is what I think like. I mean, you only knew about this for a week, so I'm not even going to try and, and act like you should have been more prepared for this because it's not <laughs> you knew better. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, I would really, before you go and do something like this again, sit down and talk about, think about like a sales pitch strategy. And not only think about it from how, how you pitch it to get a donation, but think about how, how if you were on the other side, how you would want somebody to pitch it to you. I mean, so you were there representing another brand. Mm-hmm. And I could see any one of them seeing you as a competitor and not as somebody who wants to help their business. Mm-hmm. I don't know, I don't know how like how what it is like in the industry, but you know, sometimes you're it's not seen as like a welcome thing for somebody else to come and say like, "Hey, it's like Chevy going to Ford and say like, "Hey, can we get one of your Fiestas so we can just drive it around for fun?" They're probably going to be like, <laughs> right. "Nah, like you can go buy one." You work for a business that's established, mm-hmm. you know, that's a bricks and mortar and people come in there and they actually play games. And I think maybe an approach that you might want to take next time because you're still the little guy on the block would be to just go to a Gen Con or, or as, as the Rook mm-hmm. and play and go to these and do a bunch of demos. And instead of asking for something for free, ask for a business card, right? Mm. Ask for a contact and then, you know, take notes about what you liked and what you didn't like and use it as a, as a research tool. So that way, when you go back the for maybe the first initial times, you don't get anything free. You know what you like. And when you call these people, when you go to network with them, you will you know about their product and mm. that builds, that builds a relationship off the bat because now that you're not just asking for something and they're kind of trusting you in the hopes that it will actually go to where it's supposed to go. But mm. you're calling them from an established place with a landline and internet and customers and management and owners that you want to, that you want to bring something to, you know, and maybe you're not the person who's making all the calls all the time. Maybe it's, you know, the owner who's doing this and it, it, you see how you create like a connection now instead of just having a handoff. That's one thing I would try and do, I think, is be more of a be more of somebody who's um, consuming than actually selling at first. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about that and the, the importance of relationships in this whole thing rather than just the handoff of the product. Right. And I don't right. wanna I don't want to turn this into a business show because there are plenty of much better <laughs> business podcasts than ours. <laughs> <laughs> But I do think, particularly when you're dealing with a community, and especially a creative community, having those relationships is so important. I mean, so much of mm-hmm. what has helped us with this show over the last 6, 12 months has been building relationships with other people who make podcasts. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and we don't do nearly as good of a job of it as we could. <laughs> I mean, if we hustled a little bit harder, we could be doing a lot better. But I think just having those relationships and building those ties is so important. So that when things happen, like David Lore has extra tickets to Concert Against Humanity, I can quickly see that on Twitter and tag you and say, hey, one of the guys from my podcast is at Gen right. Con, you should meet up with him. Like Those sorts of little run-ins mean more in the long run than getting a game at the first convention, you know? For right. sure. And, and I, I don't think... think it's... I think it's really what I was looking for, is... Yeah. is but, but anyway, continue. And, and making connections doesn't always have to be like going up and talking to people face to face. I think coming at it from, I, I mean, you can you can tell that Taylor and I both have different strategies in terms of like how do you um, network? Because I, I feel like you sometimes I'm not a super I'm not one of those people that just like runs up to people and you know I, essentially and, like, wants calling. to talk face to face. Yeah, I'm I'm much more likely to kind of like stand in the, stand in the middle and kind of see what's going on, or go up and maybe volunteer once or twice and see what's going on to get like a really grasp to understand. So that way, when it, when I can talk to this person, I can I can show them that I actually have a genuine interest in their game. I know about it. I think I have a customer base that's ready to play this kind of game. And then it would also be cool because once you set up that name and they know you, they know where you work. You know, you can kind of. It, it it would be cool, you know, maybe you get a customer who's like, I really like this game. Can you get me, you know, can you give me some information about them? And, you know, maybe, you know, kind of give them a name and say, hey, uh, you know, make sure you put Rook OTR with this. Sincere networking is where it's at. Yeah. Right. Especially in your creative community. I mean, yeah. yeah. So I definitely think I got at least a decent start.
So our next topic comes from Ryan, who wants to guide us through the discography of Guided by Voices. Can you give us a little bit of background, Ryan? I can. Yeah. So Guided by Voices is an indie rock band. They've existed since uh, the the mid to late 80s. They've always revolved around one man, Robert Pollard, or Bob Pollard. Uh, And he kind of, I don't know if... He probably doesn't have the record for most songs composed to his name, but he's damn near close. It's it's incredible because Guided by Voices is kind of, for existing as long as they have, they've gone through so many motions of not just style, because they've always been a rock band at heart, but uh, uh, fidelity-wise, they sort of were a, they were, they're they're sort of, you know, uh, given given the name of one of the, like, champions of lo-fi, uh, and they started off as that for like on four, four tracks and stuff like that for a good part of their career. And they've, of course, graduated to producing an album with Rick Ocasek of The Cars and have, you know, since uh, reuniting the, quote, uh, classic lineup, uh, they've sort of retreated back to, or not retreated, that sounds negative, but they've gone back to the lo-fi years. And really, I think the coolest thing about them is that no matter the state of fidelity or time put into one song, uh, Bob Pollard shows that there's virtue in just kind of, if you have an idea, put it down on record. Lo and behold, a lot of it is uh, classic to not just me, but a good portion of indie rock fans, uh, music fans in general. So, yeah, I guess, uh, what what did you guys think of the playlist? I put put together, for the listeners, I put together a playlist that kind of just took a track from almost every album of theirs throughout the years. Uh, So what did you, what did you guys think? I realized that I know a lot more Guided by Voices songs than I thought I did. And I think that's largely from hearing it at parties and record stores. (laughs) Like, listening to these songs just made me feel like I was digging through the crates at a record store. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that Andrew at Hoffa's or the staff at Shake It in Cincinnati have blasted guided by voices at me over the years Mm -hmm. and i just didn't even know that that was what i was hearing and so it's nice to finally put two and two together on that i think that's a pretty fair assessment i don't think i actually knew any of the songs in particular but it's definitely felt like a band that i had kind of kind of felt like i knew already uh either by name or like kind of like by sound because it feels like it has a lot of probably elements that people have probably probably lifted whole cloth in other bands because, I mean, they've been doing this for a while, right? A while? Oh, yeah. 1983? So, yeah. Like, they've probably either directly or indirectly affected the sounds of thousands of bands. So, I, and I could definitely sense that while listening through it. So. Yeah. I, uh, one of my, I think what I, because uh, I got into them probably when I was in like sixth grade, seventh grade. And uh, what really was striking to me was um because the first things i heard were the lo-fi albums like b thousand and alien lanes are considered their lo-fi masterpieces and uh what's cool about those albums is that if you play it to anyone who's sort of a musical layman and not willing to give something a chance just based on uh, the circumstances of the production what's really great to me about guided by voices is that so many of the songs prove that you don't need ashy production to just lay down a truly great song it reminds me of something that jeff tweedy from wilco said where i think he uh i'm sorry to be moving to a different band for anecdote here but um he said following wilco's uh yankee yankee hotel foxtrot their their sort of cornerstone album uh he jeff tweedy said something like oh we're sort of shying away from that heavy product because we don't feel like computers and effects or whatever make a great song and I agree with that, uh, but I don't think it's ever been truer than hearing the really pretty, disgusting four-track uh, songs that Bob Pollard's laid down. Uh, even at their most primitive and hard to really hear, uh, I think there is a real magic to a lot of the songs that Bob Pollard's written. Yeah, that that really kind of spoke to me as well, like just how catchy these songs were, despite the lo-fi. Mm-hmm. Um, it reminds me of the really early Who records, like the Who Sings My Generation and A Quick One While She's Away or whatever. Like the first two or three Who records have that same Definitely. sort of like very cheap, very loud. You really only listen to it because the songwriting is good. Otherwise, it would just be interminable noise. And I kind of love that. Like it brings me back to a very special place that I'm really happy to hear again. For sure. 
And it's funny because Bob Pollard actually says, uh, he's been quoted in saying, uh, Bob O'Reilly is the only song worth covering. I think that's a pretty good <laughs> statement. I don't know if I completely <laughs> agree. It's bold. There are definitely more than one songs worth covering, but if you had to pick one, it's not a bad one. I definitely sensed, well, maybe it's pro- I'm probably sensing the same the same feeling, but I thought Kings or the uh, when I when I listened to them, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. uh, but that's probably also at least in the same wheelhouse as the the Who that he probably was mostly influenced by. So that makes sense. Yeah, Bob Pollard's. I mean, spoken openly about his influence of of all of that. Uh, you know, the Kinks are the preservation the great whatever that album is the preservation society preservation great yeah, society yeah. uh and you know the who i mean they're uh, is one of his favorite bands but it's it's crazy too because he also uh early guided by voices he took a lot of influence from rem uh, as well which is, is still in the jangly like jangle rock wheelhouse as well um but yeah i mean he definitely wears his influences on his sleeve and, and got a my voices does emulate that no holds barred sort of garage rock. Like, let's just do it. Let's just plug our amps, you know, turn our amp up, plug it in and just, just let it rock, you know? Um, yeah, definitely a lot of British invasion. So that part is really interesting to me, knowing your musical output, because a lot of the stuff that you do is more acoustic, not to say that you haven't done electric music, but you play a lot more acu- acoustic music. So I'm curious, like, how do you think Guided by Voices has influenced your musical style or your songwriting techniques? Uh, if anything, uh, even if not uh, techniques or style, Pollard's method, for sure. Uh, I know Taylor, you know Tyler and, and uh, Sean, maybe not be as familiar, but uh, Taylor has been to a few shows of mine in college, and uh, I have a relatively verbose for the time that I've been working and recording as a musician I have a relatively uh, dense band camp page <laughs> like a, I, I generally put out you know an album or two a year generally two uh, and I think I've definitely page from people like Bob Pollard and you know maybe like Mark e. Smith of the fall by just any idea for a song I've had recording it making it as as best as it can be and uh, not really, I don't have in my output a lot of B-sides or unreleased tracks. I generally think it's, uh, a friend of mine once told me that the music I write is a little bit more of a snapshot of my day-to-day, and so uh, it would it would kind of feel like I'm cheating whoever listens to it if I were to omit a track I've recorded. So, yeah, so I, so I subscribe to Pollard's school of, you know, his methodology of just kind of recording everything and just putting it out there, no matter if it embarrasses me or something. So in that sense, I've definitely uh, taken that tip from Guided by Voices. Tyler, how do you feel about that, this idea of release everything? Because that's not how you work with your design work, I know, but I'm curious, both musically and non-musically. I mean, it feels like the right way to do things. Well, maybe not the right way, but um, <laughs> it's, it's certainly a way. Um <laughs> No, but I think it's I think it's a a healthy way because I feel like it you don't really kind of like okay the pros and the cons the cons is that you could have songs that you push out that you think maybe like a few a few years like later you you're like man that could be a, that song could be a little bit better so you could have like remorse that you didn't like hold on to it and save it for like a like a later time when you could like really work through it mm-hmm. but also I think there's a, a better. Uh, I think the better thing to do is just to not worry about it and just keep pushing forward and just keep going along because, I mean, I guess maybe it's just in the case of when you're trying to learn that it's a good idea because I think you just want to cover as much ground as possible. And I think pushing your stuff out there, seeing what people like, kind of like when you're trying to really get your, like, footing kind of really trying to figure yourself out i mean i guess like if you're like like you've been doing it for like 30 years you're like well maybe i don't need to push out every single song i've ever made i don't know but i mean that seems reasonable to me but it's definitely not something that i do myself but i feel like i should do more i should be more compelled to just push put stuff out there see how it goes and then kind of let it live or fall like live or die based on you know so i think um what tyler was saying is interesting i don't create this way either i think i'm much more like i love that we can edit this podcast now and we're not recording it live because i love to omit the things that i say that sound stupid (laughs) but i think there's there is kind of a value in that almost documentary like idea of you know get the thought down release the thought 
repeat cycle, like over and over and over again. Yeah. You reach a certain tenure as a band, uh, I think, with Guided by Voices, especially having, I don't know if it's 30 albums exactly, but close to 30 albums or in that ballpark. It's it's not even a luck of the draw thing where you're like, oh, they put out another album. For instance, Guided by Voices' most recent album, Please Be Honest, I wasn't a huge fan of. But... I know that they plan to record another one with whatever lineup he's working with in, in September, I think. And I'm excited for that because there's always going to be, you know, hidden gems on, on whatever they're working on. Uh, and, and who knows? It could be up there with the classics of, of their you know, rep, uh, repertoire. But, um, yeah, it just it really depends. It's, it's like after you work for so long, you don't necessarily have – if you have a bat that's – considered bad by all fronts it's not like a smear on your reputation it's just kind of like well they have 25 other albums to choose from and they're all pretty decent so you know uh so i think that's really another cool thing about guided by voices longevity is just it's a their work ethic is a real testament to how genuinely you know sincere about rock they are as a band and with that drive they rarely make I, I don't think I'd ever point to a Guided by Voices album and say, like, like that's pure shit, you know? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, like, that's fundamentally awful. Because they, they're just so, they're so driven to just record as much rock music as possible. And I really, there's something beautiful about that. I think that's beautiful. Uh, and the average, the average Guided by Voices song is extremely quality, and I, uh, I'm very glad that they're in my life. <laughs> so... With a band that has such a long career, you know, 30 plus years, it can sometimes be intimidating to new listeners. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think the best way to approach the, frankly, gargantuan discography of Guided Mm -hmm. by Voices. Like, how do you even begin to understand this band? Well, I was talking to a friend of mine about this recently who's another big fan uh and we both had the same entry way into guided by voices i think we both bought a cd that's like a greatest hits and i say that with quotes around uh because i'm not sure i mean bob pollard always jokes that he's written the most songs without ever having a hit but um it's it's this cd called human human amusements human amusements at hourly rates and it just compiles, I think, about 30 tracks uh, from Guided by Voices through from their first album through uh, I forget what I forget what they had out at that point. Maybe Earthquake Glue or something, but uh, several albums, and they just kind of plucked tracks. And it's a good uh, sample platter of Guided by Voices. You hear because their earliest stuff isn't a track uh, or well some of it is but like some of it is studio quality so you hear the really early REM influenced stuff and then you hear the straight up lo-fi stuff and then you hear uh, there was a point in the band's career where they Bob Pollard joined uh, the band Cobra Verde and they kind of just served as guided by voices and you hear and that's really polished studio stuff so that's a good I think that's honestly a, I'm not one to I'm, I'm much more of an album guy and I for the most part don't like the idea of greatest hits albums because I think they're kind of sometimes demeaning of the band's work as a whole but in Guided by Voices' case, I think this this uh, album, Human Amusements at Hourly Rates, is a very good sampling for for someone who's completely new to the band. I think it's a good, like, you get bits and pieces of each phase of their career, and I think that's a good place to start. Especially wetting your palate with the lo-fi albums like B-1000. It's good because, one, you hear them at their lowest fidelity, but two, it's some of their best songs ever. So... There's, there's really, I mean, sound quality wise, there's only, the only way to go is up. So, you know, there, there are several, it's, it's tough. It's just kind of luck of the draw, I guess. But there's, in my opinion, there's no wrong way to enter. I have an interesting relationship with greatest hits albums, because I feel like when I was starting to kind of like get into music, my dad would buy me like all sorts of like CDs and stuff. I distinctly remember getting like, uh, like a Led Zepp one, like greatest hits that was like two discs and I had like most of the stuff on it. But it's like, it's always kind of like you reach a point when you, um, you're like, well, I want like the rest of this album. And it's like, I think the greatest hits is almost like kind of irrelevant in a streaming world. I mean, that's a, that's a challenging thought, right? 
our greatest hits irrelevant? Because I think they're even more relevant. They just don't come in a package anymore. Now they're well, okay. just a playlist. I guess, I, I, okay, well, I guess physical music. Oh, yeah. Streaming and, music, it's the most important. But yeah, nobody's going out and buying greatest hits CDs anymore. Right. I don't think anyone's going out and buying CDs at all. My thing about greatest hits albums is that I was the type when I was younger uh, to never illegally download music. I always bought CDs, which sounds incrementally dumb time goes on. But uh, the thing with Greatest Hits albums is that if you buy a Greatest Hits album, and then you find yourself really getting into that band, like it happened to me with Yola Tango and Guided by Voices, where I ended up just buying, made up the Greatest Hits album. Like, I'd buy all of the individual albums, and then it made owning the Greatest Hits disc obsolete. So there's a really great essay that I'll link to in the show notes from Chuck Klosterman about why loving Kiss is also hating Kiss. And a big portion of it talks about every time you buy a Kiss album, it has rock and roll all night on it. And he says, like, as a Kiss fan, you hate that Kiss keeps making you buy this song over and over again. (laughs) But you also kind of love it at the same time. And I think that's so true. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've bought She Loves You by the Beatles on various different discs and comps and whatever. But I own the hell out of that song now. Mm. You know? <laughs> That's funny. I, 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 there's a similar thing about the Smiths where they constantly, like, they have several greatest hits albums, like, or just compilations like Rank and Hat Full of Hollow and Louder Than Bombs. And they all are just kind of different arrangements of the track listing. Their greatest hits. Well, and the Smiths only had like four albums. Four albums, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit ridiculous. And then, and then they came out with just a few years ago. It was like the Best of the Smiths Volume One, <laughs> which had most of the same. It was once again like, oh, is this a repressing of Louder Than Bombs in just a different order? You know, <laughs> it's like buying a Ramones CD. Yeah, <laughs> or the Misfits. It's like buying a Misfits CD. Is probably a better comparison. <laughs> yeah, a band that really only released about fifty songs. Right. So. If somebody is looking to get into Guided by Voices, we will put your playlist in the description. I th- I think it's a fair recommendation to tell them to go ahead and listen to a Greatest Hits, don't you? I do think if you start with Human Amusements or at hourly rates, that is a fair face of Guided by Voices. And then you can sort of pick which era you like the best and go from there. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for bringing this to us. I guess I never really realized how much I like this band. Oh, yeah. One of the best. All right, our next topic tonight comes from Sean, who wants to talk about the Olympics. Hey, everybody. So this week, I decided that we were going to talk about the Olympics since we have a month of it, probably. I don't know. It's going to go on for a long time. But on the news this this week uh, in D.C., they were talking about the relationship that people have with the Olympics. And it was kind of interesting because people seem to be, like, really either into the Olympics or just don't give a crap about the Olympics. It got me thinking, like, do I really like the Olympics? And then I wanted to ask, do you guys like the Olympics? So my first question is, do you plan on watching the Olympics? I haven't yet. Do you plan on it? Maybe. Is it streaming on Twitch? <laughs> no, I don't think esports is a is an Olympic game yet, but just hold off, because maybe in like eight years. I'm pretty well, sure that's a Re- winter Olympic game. Hold on. Hold on a second. The Republican National Convention, I don't think, is a video game either. So I don't know. Let's just, let's just check, check our privilege at the door, okay? <laughs> I think we could have the Olympics on Twitch if we really want. <laughs> I was more casting that as esports might be an Olympic sport someday. I was hoping that you that would get like a hooray from you, but you seem to just well, want to throw in your hater shades for anything now. I know. Well, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Taylor gonna watch the Olympics. So I don't have cable, and that prevents me. Uh, but I do watch. I saw that gymnast uh, break the fuck out of his leg. <laughs> I don't know. So you you've seen all the, all the troll Olympics. <laughs> seen that, and uh, I don't know. I, as far as being interested in this, so I can I can say right off the bat, I am more of a Winter Olympics kind of guy. Uh, I just prefer, I, I like the Winter Olympics more. Um, and there are certain things about, I like watching gymnastics, uh, various, I don't know, diving is pretty cool. But there are certain, I mean, as far as U.S. competitors, you find out about who they are 
I mean, for instance, uh, did you guys hear about Ray Lochte? He dyed his hair like ice blue for this year's Olympics. It's very goofy. It's like a, yeah, it's like a gimmicky Fish thing person. to be like, all right, you look like, yeah, you look like Martin Short as Jack Frost in the Santa Claus. Uh, yeah, so it's just like, if that's who's representing us, I'm not too thrilled to be <laughs> watching it. But, I, you know, I enjoy the competition of it. It's 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 a wholly positive thing, you know. I think he's representing Team Mystic. I think America <laughs> is Team Mystic. I think it's what he's trying to say. The right team. <laughs> I Taylor, uh, <laughs> any any sports there, buddy? That's true. Um, so I haven't watched any Olympics yet because I was in New Mexico all week last week. Mm-hmm. I usually catch the Olympics if it's on. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of like Ryan, I'm more of a summer Olympics person. I think snowboard. He was a, he was a winter Olympics or a, person. more of a winter okay. Olympics person. Sorry, I'm more of a winter Olympics person. Okay, I think like. The snowboarding is sweet, and the luge is terrifying and awesome. I don't know, like, those sports just seem so much more inherently dangerous, which I think is why I'm interested in them. I did hear a rumor that they're going to bring jousting into the Summer Olympics, though, and I am fucking pumped about so you jousting. Just, so you just want to watch an Olympic sport where somebody dies? Not where somebody <laughs> dies, I just well, want it to be so, dangerous. Just, so, nothing dangerous about... Riding a bike at 50 miles an hour down a Brazilian hillside? No, I think... dangerous I, enough for you? No, I think the cycling is sweet as well. I was thinking more about, like, I can watch about two minutes of diving, and then it all starts looking the same to me. Or swimming. Like, I really don't need to see Michael Phelps move really fast underwater. I don't really said, care. Said like somebody who is entrenched in land privilege. Just saying. <laughs> That's Just what saying. it is. Hashtag land privilege. So, I'm, I'm so privileged that I have two legs and can walk on the ground. Take that, fish. <laughs> Come at me. Um, I feel like most sports are really just the same thing over and over again. Like golf? Technically, it's just a guy just standing somewhere and he's hitting the ball. And there's been a lot of controversy with Olympic golf that I don't really want to get into, but I oh. really don't care about Olympic golf. Well, that's that's another question. That's another question, though. So I have definitely watched the Olympics because I feel like it's like visiting your grandmother or something. Like, you only have to care about it every four years, and you kind of enjoy it at first, but after three weeks of it, you're, like, kind of tired of it. It just doesn't matter at one point. But, like, when else do you care about swimming or gymnastics? I'm more concerned that you only visit your grandmother every four years. Well, I don't visit... That wasn't a literal thing. Hey, man, I don't know how to take it. Listen, you just throw on the hater shades for the entire Summer Olympics. You just, like, categorically... There's been a lot of categorical hate for the Summer Olympics so far between you three. You're damn right. I mean... Tyler pretty much just said golfing is just swinging a stick at a little white ball. And, That's right. You're and you're a, fish, first. you're a fish hater. And Ryan seems to be, like, uh, blasé about the whole thing, so... I mean, football is you throw the ball and you you walk back and forth, so... Thanks for your intriguing coverage. So, um... <laughs> Tennis is really is the game where nothing happens. What sport, if you had to pick one, would you participate in and why? Of, of the current Olympic sports. Fencing. Why? <laughs> Not really. It just seems the coolest, but it's probably actually it's probably reasonably painful. I would imagine, even if it isn't supposed to. Well, you don't actually get stabbed. Well, I know, but it's you know still getting poked a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah, that's how it works. Taylor, rock climbing is not an Olympic sport. No, shows <laughs> how much you know about the Olympics. Well, it is an X Games sport, and so I wasn't sure. If that's the case, then I don't know. Probably one of the relays. Which one? I, I, I don't know. I don't think it really matters. Mm. They're all running and passing batons. I, I hate you. Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> Is mayonnaise an Olympic sport? Oh my God. Basically. <laughs> what would you like to partake in in the Olympics? I'd, I'd say baseball. And that's a boring answer. But just because yeah, that's all right. Yeah, I enjoy it. I mean, it's not it's not what you think of because like it's not exclusive to the Olympics. But yeah, I mean, I think it's cool. To, that'd be pretty sweet. I think I definitely want to go hardcore on a badminton court. Oh yeah. That oh, I awesome. totally forgot oh, about badminton. That's what I mean. There are changing so many my cool answer. Sports. Ping pong. Yeah, ping pong would be sweet. There's so many cool sports, and you guys just pick like a random one. Like you think this is a serious question though. Like look it up and see which one you actually want to participate in. Fine, I'm firing up the Googler. This is <laughs> this is a great way to fire up the Googler segment. Isn't speed because walking? There's speed walking. Right? Do yeah, we have a sound clip walking. for oh, firing up the Googler yet? 
I'll, I'll, I'll make something. Okay. <laughs> um, but I mean, like, I really want to play badminton because when you watch it, it's like, it's so dramatic because it starts out so slow with your little shuttlecock, you just kind of hit it up there over the net, and it's, like, so elegant, just, like, floating in the air, and then it's all fast-paced, and then it's all slow, and it's all fast and slow, and you got the, you know, like, yeah. it's actually super exciting for uh, something that you, everybody's family had a set of in their backyard that you never actually played with. <laughs> That's a good point. You know what, now that I've Googled it, I think I'm probably going to have to say one of the shooting events. Okay. I don't know, maybe Air Pistol. Nice. Because I am a terrible trap shooter, and I don't know, rifle just isn't that fun. Tyler Ryan, after you fired up the Googler? What about laser Any... rifles? Do we have those yet? No, no not yet. Shit. Well, what's the fucking point? <laughs> Shit, I already said mayonnaise. God. Um. <laughs> Way to kill your own joke, idiot. Shit. Oh, I, w- I like archery in theory, but I don't think I actually would. Oh, you don't You don't have to be... The... I like all the old world What you want to do. Okay. I like... I think that's kind of what I'm into. So, so you would do like the medieval, like what if there was like a medieval style, like decathlon or something, where you had to do like archery I mean, and pole vault and joust. wrestling and joust and <laughs> so what you're like, saying like is javelin throw and fencing. So you put you, you put you on part- the armor, you joust, and then you go for a swim. And then you, then you shoot an arrow, and then you scale uh, a castle wall. Well, that, well, that's where the that's where the pole vault would come in because you'd have to pole vault over the moat and into the castle. I mean, I feel like I would be so into jousting at the time. Obviously, I'm not right now because it's incredibly dangerous and not, and I value my life a little too much. But if I was just like peasant boy and whatever, who cares? I'm dying like five years from some stupid disease anyway. I mean, I'm in. I mean, that's not the reason that I would do jousting, but okay. Well, other than the fact that it's gentleman's sport and all that, you know. Taylor just likes to ride horses. I actually don't. I fucking hate horses, but I love swords. <laughs> And fencing is lame. Well, Taylor, I hate to tell you, but uh, you don't use a sword in joust. That's true. Come the fuck at me. (laughs) Swords, giant poles that are basically pointy sticks, they're like the same things. It's a little bit more like a spear, but that's fine. What What if we gave you like a pole vaulting pole and a motorcycle? I'm so in. Okay. I'm so in on that. (laughs) <laughs> That's like some crazy evil Knievel shit. I love it. Ryan, uh, you gonna you gonna change your answer? You gonna stay with baseball? I I am gonna change my answer. So baseball would be great. That's still like a top three for me. But I'm thinking after seeing the list, <sighs> table tennis or oh yeah. There's a there's something called trampoline that just I mean that's that's very enticing. I that's a that's a that's a um a gymnastic sport. Yeah. So like. Why not? I mean, even if I don't have a routine, like I'll just <laughs> I'll just jump I'll just jump on a trampoline for a few minutes and call it a day, you know. <laughs> that definitely sounds like the most fun for someone yeah, who that's... has no idea what they're doing. That's yeah, a great idea. Yeah, that's a, yeah that's if a you get if if you get like you know if the judges hold up a bunch of zeros, whatever, you just jumped on a trampoline for two minutes, you know. I mean, it's cool by me. And you got a free trip to Rio. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, some people might not think that's great, but... If you were going to be your own country for the Olympics, what country would you be? You can make it up. <laughs> what would your country be called, and what would, be, what, would be, what would your flag look like? I think that Atlanta should just go ahead and secede from Georgia and be its own state. <laughs> so I guess why not the city-state of Atlanta? And our flag would probably just be a big picture of Mayor Kasim Reed's face. Because why not? No, actually, it would be um, a diagram of the freeway system of Atlanta and just big red dotted lines showing all of the traffic everywhere. That's what mm-hmm. our flag would be. I guess mine would be, I mean, the thought of having my own nation to compete in the Olympics is <laughs> absurd to me. But so I, I guess I would, I guess I would make it like a troll nation or something. So I'd call it like the people's first Republic of Harambe. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my flag would just be the emoji where it's like winking, but the tongue is out. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be it. <laughs> is, your, is your national anthem just Africa by Toto? 
No. Well, so we'd advertise that it's Africa by Toto, but when you actually listen to it, it's never going to give you up by Rick Astley. Oh. <laughs> I was going to say, would you Rick Roll? We Rick Roll with our national right. album. <laughs> yeah. Tyler, any ideas? Our country that Catherine and I and Jekyll the cat live in is Jekyll Town. <laughs> our flag is a picture of Jekyll, and it's just <laughs> a big black flag with two little very simplified kitty eyes and his little white smoke stack that goes across his face <laughs> well isn't that adorable <laughs> it sure is <laughs> i think my country would be oh man i'm i'm, I'm torn between Believeland and lebracklin <laughs> <laughs> but I really want to go with a little Brackrin. And the flag would be just a used tire attached to a pole. <laughs> like a bald tire. I love it. Um, maybe have like an A in the middle of it or something. Um, okay, so just because we should ask this question. What sport would you like to see in the 2020 Olympics? You can put any anything in there. What would you like to see? Breakdance battles. Oh, good answer. Like electric boogaloo, like like break into electric boogaloo, like crazy break dance battles with even like revolving platforms mm-hmm. to throw you off balance. That would be super sweet. See, I'm gonna build on Ryan's answer and say Wipeout. Ooh, like NBC's Wipeout, the game yeah. that's like American Ninja Warrior for idiots. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good description. I just want to see a bunch of super athletic people fall on their faces for like an hour. Jenga. Ooh. Nice. And like 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 table Jenga or like actual if one of these actually falls on you, it could kill you, Jenga. Battle Ooh. Jenga. Battle Jenga? Yeah. What is that? <laughs> that that well, I I made it up. But okay. Well, tell I've us what it is. What is Battle Jenga? This new sport you invented that's going to be in actually. Sport. It would really. It would. I would really want it to be junk art, which is a new game that came out. But that will go with Jenga because it's a classic. But uh, it would definitely be large wooden blocks. I definitely think it would. It would. It would definitely have. You definitely would need a ladder. I think. Like okay, so railroad ties too big, too small. <laughs> Listen, this isn't the strongman competition, okay? I don't know how how quickly they would fall over, but <laughs> they weigh a lot. I don't know if I want them to be that big, maybe okay. about half that size. Okay, you definitely want it to fall over, right? And you want the possibility of someone being injured when it falls on them. I mean, that's a side effect. Fair also, enough. also uh, honorary mention is probably jousting. Well, jousting is the serious answer because they're actually considering that. Nobody cares about that. Are they really? Yeah, no, they're really actually considering bringing jousting to 2020. Shit. I'm in. I'm fucking in. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. Okay, so I would like to see disc golf. I I don't know. I don't know why. Well, I don't know why. It's because you fucking love disc golf. <laughs> I haven't I haven't played in a while, but I I think like it's played all over the world, so I think people can get into it. Can... I think I assumed it was in the Olympics. That's that's surprising. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, because I I figured like if people are playing disc golf and it's not an Olympic sport, like what are they working towards? You know, <laughs> it's fun. Again. Yeah, it's fun, but like it should be an Olympic sport. Earlier, I guess either today or yesterday, as we record this, it won't really matter when this goes public. Um, Somebody on Twitter made a comment about the commentators on the Olympics basically saying they were boring or something to that extent um, and suggested that Leslie Jones replace them. Who is Leslie Jones? Leslie Jones is one of the current cast members of Saturday Night Live. Okay. And essentially, somebody at NBC read this tweet and said, sure, why not? And tweeted at Leslie Jones and said, call X person and be prepared. We're booking you a flight to Reno tomorrow. And so as we record, Leslie Jones is en route to the Olympics to cover it for NBC or SNL or both. Okay, so here's the question. At the beginning, I asked you if you would watch the Olympics. Would you watch the Olympics if you knew there was going to be a se- a three like a segment every day that would be narrated by comedians. Oh, Morgan absolutely. Freeman. For sure. You would tune in into that. That would make the Olympics more exciting for you? 
Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, John Stewart made the new, the news more exciting. So yeah, they yes. sent some SNL people to the both the Republican and Democratic conventions this year, and I thought that was awesome. I think the Olympics could be even more fun. Yeah. So that's how we that's how we spice up the Olympics. Just add some comedians to it. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Who would? Okay, so this will be my last question. What comedian would you like to see cover what sport? It's not a summer Olympics, but that's all right. That's all right. But I really want Hannibal Burris to narrate ice dancing. <laughs> oh my oh, god! I yes. almost said that. That's wow. what I was thinking. Like I want to see Hannibal Burris do um, do ice skating. That is perfect. <laughs> okay, so I feel like I need everyone to. I, I need help with this one. <laughs> what? Uh, what? event would louis ck be good at doing <laughs> like rhythmic gymnastics <laughs> <laughs> i'm in <laughs> i would say um like tig nataro doing shooting would be pretty funny uh her commentary is extremely deadpan and i feel like skeet shooting is the f- like farthest from her acceptance of <laughs> something that's considered skillful. I think she would, I think it would be very funny to hear her talk about people shooting uh, white discs in the distance. <laughs> yeah. She's very intellectual. Yeah. Which makes skate shooting a great fit. Uh, yeah. 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 Cause she would kind of just spell it out like it legitimately is. And I think her talking, not not in a scientific or clinical way, but she's very realist about whatever's going on. I, I just think it would be funny to hear her talking about people shooting objects in the sky. Have you guys seen the videos on YouTube of uh, Snoop Dogg narrating, like, um, animal shows? Yes, they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of, like, not answer my question, kind of answer at the same time. I want him to do a highlight of every sport. <laughs> like he's doing one of those nature shows <laughs> and especially like the obscure ones like the horse riding like the uh, all the all the equestrian sports i want to see him narrate that i'm pretty sure his summary of all of them is just gonna be yeah that dude's riding a horse <laughs> i don't know some of them was, some of those are really good he goes in some really strange directions either way i agree comedians at the olympics that's the way to go that's yeah. how to spice it up all right that was a segment And now it's time to round the show out like we always do with a round of shameless plugs from the panel. Tyler Reed, what would you like the people to do this week? Hi, everybody. You can find my design work at tylerdreed.com. You can find me on the socials as TDR Design on Instagram and Twitter. You can also follow the, the Rook on Twitter as the Rook OTR. We also have a Facebook, but I don't run that, so just follow, just follow the Twitter, please. <laughs> Fair enough. Sean Evans, where can the people find you? People can find me at, at S Evans eight nine ten or eight nine one zero. Love it. Um, I got. I'm working on Rip Comics actually in production now, um, so look for it maybe this week. Uh, other than that. Oh, I'm probably going to have a Spotify playlist come out this week, too. I'm working really hard on that, because I know we're talking about summer tunes, and uh, I want to put together some stuff that I really like, so hopefully we'll put some stuff on Facebook for you to check out. Because clearly I need some help with my summer tunes. It's okay, Tyler. You've just lost all taste in music over the past three months. It's been fine. <laughs> I, got- I only listen to podcasts anymore. What's wrong with me? I hate to break it to you, Tyler. If this keeps up, you're going to start carrying a tote bag, and I'm going to stop hanging out with you in public. All right, Ryan Gabus, thanks for joining us. What would you like the people to do? Well, thank you for having me. I really, uh, this was a lot of fun. I, uh, I guess, uh, you know, you can check out uh, Soto Voce Music. That's S O T T O V O C E Music dot Bandcamp dot com. All my music and stuff is there. My Twitter handle is at Infinity Uncool, and uh, you know, there you go. It's, I, I really appreciate you having me. <laughs> And we're always glad to hear from you and hear that you're doing well. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at TC Olmsted. You can follow the show on Twitter at Dudes Brunch, and of course, like us on Facebook. If you really like us, you can leave a review on iTunes. That helps new people learn what this show is about. And other than that, we will hopefully be back with a new episode next week, although still lots of travel in the future, so maybe, maybe not. I guess you'll just have to find out. 
<laughs> these uh, these shameless plugs are already paying off. Tyler just followed me on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> hey, what up? <laughs> already reaping the benefits. <laughs> it's that dude's brunch bump. It's that dude's brunch bump. <laughs> the DBB. <laughs> did you notice it? Oh, neither did we. <laughs> So speaking of... God damn it, Sean. (laughs) It's even worse when I don't have the camera on, because then I can't see you doing that. There's no, like, wind-up or anything. You know how hard it is to listen for you, like, right before you go go to make something? I have to listen real close for you to go.